Welcome to Baseball and Coffee, episode 50. We made it uh, with Tino and Aaron. Uh, what's going <laughs> I on? I wasn't thinking about that. That's good. Right? Not too much. How are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. That's a pretty uh, awesome guy. milestone. You yeah. told me this time last year we would record 50 podcasts. I was like, what? <laughs> right? Totally. Uh, today we're going to cover, it's going to do some reaction on a bunch of free agent signings, um, what we think about them, both from a uh, fantasy standpoint and probably a little bit of real life as well. It's been a whirlwind of uh, f- baseball signings the last couple of weeks, winter meetings, which has always been a, a goal of mine to get to the winter meetings. Maybe one one day I will. Um, but yeah, lots of movement, lots of fantasy impact. Uh, let's get started. Uh, coffee story. You got anything for us? Yeah. So as promised, uh, I was going to be sharing some of the coffees that I brought back from Vermont. So the first one I opened was this uh, from Vermont Artisan Coffee, uh, Light Roast Kenya Double A. Mm -hmm. So Kenya has a very unique way of grading their coffees when they export them. Double A, from my understanding, has to do with the size of the bean, uh, as well as the quality, of course, in the cup. Uh, It's considered one of their highest quality coffees. It was lovely. Um, Everything that I know Kenya to be uh, would, would buy another bag in a second, you know, just whiny and grapefruity, a little bit of floral. Uh, the acidity and juiciness of this coffee, I think, is really unique. Um, I, I could drink it every day. But, yeah, I, I don't get a chance to have Kenya too often. I've never had Kenya. I can't recommend it enough, at least try it. And uh, mm. I know some people don't respond to it great. As we talked about, when people sometimes get acidic coffee, they can respond to that as bitter. Uh, some people are sensitive to bitter, such that they have a lot of, uh, sugar in their diet and things like that so but uh, I, it was lovely absolutely lovely awesome kenya is i have not had kenyan coffee in probably a few years now but it was when i owned coffee shops it was my favorite um country uh to drink coffee from hands down i think it's unique and interesting and sweet and complex and kind of everything that you ever look for. And yeah, you are right that double A is a, uh, essentially a, a slightly larger size bean than, than your typical kind of standard coffee bean. Good stuff, man. It sounds good. I'm, uh, continuing to enjoy my standard Walla Walla roastery coffee. And I don't really have, I'm kind of in a coffee rut right now. I got to get out of town to go have some new coffee experiences Maybe coming up here soon, we'll look for some coffee shops in Arizona. <laughs> right? Let's, yep. All right. Let's get started. Um, this will be uh, slightly chronological um, as far as the list goes. That's just kind of how making the list turned out uh, for us. But we're going to run down the list of some some of the signings and trades and just kind of talk a little bit about um, what our reactions are to them. Uh, starting with uh, Anthony Rizzo signing, with, re-signing with the New York Yankees, one year, $17 million. Uh, there wasn't a lot of options on the first base market. Um, Rizzo re-signing in New York. Uh, what do you think about that, uh, both real life and fantasy? I think real life, it was a pretty slam dunk. I think he wanted to be there. Matt Park fits him really well. Um, I think he was pretty public that he loved being a Yankee. Mm-hmm. Um, I think from a fantasy perspective, um, it's it's a great it's a great landing spot. I think he exceeded my expectations last year. Um, in terms of the power he showed, um, mm-hmm. 480 slug was the best we've seen of him since 2019. Mm-hmm. Um, however, his his batting average did dip, um, 224. I would expect that to regress back closer to his league. You know, his career average is um, two fit 265, and with the rules adjustments and I would expect him to be, you know, at least above 245, 250. So I think it's a an end up era fantasy wise, second year there. You know, I think the lineup context is pretty neutral. It's mm-hmm. going to be about the same. They haven't really done anything too much besides keeping Judge. So um, they were fourth in the league last year in WRC plus. So I, you know, I'd expect another, another uh, very similar season to what he did this year. And if I rostered him, you know, I would be, I'd be happy about that, truthfully. Yeah, he was he was someone that I considered going after on the trade market um, this off season. I he did make some swing changes. He his launch angle was was uh, greater than it's ever been. 
Um, it was 19.3 degrees this year. He's pretty clearly trying to, to uh, yank the ball out of Yankee Stadium. His barrel was double digit percentage for the first time in his career. Um, like, as you said, his average did go down. Uh, his poll rate was 48.1%, which was the highest since his rookie year in San Diego. Um, the one thing that I, I don't think will, the rules, the shift will impact him all that much. He did, he was a 33.2% ground ball guy last year and only 17.5% line drive. So he's, like I say, he's very clearly trying to hit fly balls to right field in Yankee Stadium. But um, given what he did last season, I think, you know, he's, he's probably due for another 300 or uh, 30 home run season with um, a 10% walk, 10% plus walk rate and, and uh, 800 OPS. So at first base, um, I currently have him ranked number 10. So he is a starter in a, I think in a, a 12 or a 15 team league. Um, I like Rizzo a lot. Uh, Resigning there made a lot of sense to me as well. Uh, next transaction we have is Teos Teoscar Hernandez going from the Toronto Blue Jays to the Seattle Mariners to start in the outfield for the Mariners. Uh, he was traded for Eric Swanson and Adam Mako. Uh, your reactions to that? You know, it's interesting. I assume they have him starting at DH. I was going to pull up roster resource. Um, why don't why I do that? If you wouldn't mind, I'd love to hear your initial thoughts, and then I'll yeah. respond to that. Sure. Um, so he's an upgrade over Hanniger. We'll start there. Um, I think part of it is just that he's been healthy. Uh, he's a bit more of a slugger than Hanniger was. I think of him as the Hanniger replacement, right? Um, and he's a bit more of a slugger than Hanniger was. Uh, he had a 800 OP or uh, 800 OPS last year, which I love. Uh, it was a 129 WRC plus last year. I think it's the consistency of his play that uh, the Mariners like. I don't know that there's a lot of upside on what he's done over the past couple of years, but there's production. Um, WRC plus the last three years, 142, 132, 129. Um, I think that's pretty awesome for the Mariners to pick that up. Uh, you know, what, what do I expect? I expect a low on base percentage, 270 hitter that's going to hit 25 to 30 home runs. And in a, a good Mariners lineup, depending on where he hits, he'll probably have 100 RBIs. Uh, defensively, uh, he's had a negative war, um, negative fan graphs war defensively every year of his career. I think that'll continue. Um, having Julio playing in center, I think you, you'll see him a little bit in the corners, um, but I do think that he DHs quite a bit. Uh, but again, I think it's more about his health and his consistency in production than it is anything else, right? If, you, if he's replacing a combination of Winker and Hanniger, you're talking about two off, last year at least, two off injured players who were inconsistent in their production. Um, so even if the upside's not quite as high as say it was for Winker, he's still going to be, I think, a, big, a better fit for the Mariners. I loved it. I thought it was great. I What I don't want to see is them give him a um, big extension. I think he's a player that if you can sign him to a higher AAV um, over the next couple of years, maybe you sign him through 25 or sign him through 26, something like that. I'd be a fan of that, but a, a four or five year contract, which I'm guessing he's going to be looking for in 24. Um, I don't, I don't really uh, want to see, you know, he's a guy that I think as he ages is going to be more at like a 300 on base percentage with production. And we've seen those outfielder, those corner outfielders go um, pretty cheaply. Uh, as far as the return uh, with Swanson and Mako, I actually really liked Adam Mako a lot. I think uh, he was in single A. I think a lot of people are talking about him strictly as a reliever, but he has uh, starter potential. Um, and then, uh, you know, Swanson is a dominant reliever, but a reliever now, nevertheless. So if you can get great production out of a corner for a reliever, um, I'm all for it. Where do you stand? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I would expect more um, low to mid-20s home runs. I think, you know, the uh, Mariners ballpark for righties is the second hardest park after the Oakland Coliseum. Mm -hmm. um, I think we saw his best season in 21 um, going into his free agent year. You know, we might see him, you know, really try to match that again. But I think uh, that ballpark and all that um, – I would expect maybe like a slight down arrow, but um, his power is legit. Uh, certainly if he's, you know, seeing the ball well, no ballpark is going to be too much of an in, uh, inhibitor for him. But 
uh, see it kind of a, a neutral, maybe a slight step back. And like I said, I think we've seen his best season, but I think it was an interesting move for the Mariners to get more pop from the right side mm-hmm. in their lineup. So his, interestingly, his uh, expected home runs in Seattle as a Mariner last year would have been higher than Toronto, believe it or not. <laughs> I'm not quite sure why. Um, and uh, obviously it's, it's placement of home run, but yeah, uh, 31 yeah. versus 28 in Toronto. So, but I do agree, you know, having gone to a, a bajillion Mariners games, you know, you've seen basically saw a, a plateau of Adrian Beltre's career because of the way the ball carries in Seattle. Um, looking at his, uh, spray chart, it is pretty clear that, uh, he hits the ball way out of, um, way out of the park as opposed to just over the fence he's no Marcus Simeon so uh, if if I share this real quickly here um I don't know can you see can you see the uh the layout of of his home runs over here I can indeed what's that I can indeed yes yeah so you see a whole bunch of home runs that are way 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 out of the park and left and left center so I think that's probably why um, and then hitting a ball out and left is not I- impossible in Seattle. So I, I like it. I'm excited. Um, if nothing else, it's a little bit of change, which is never bad. Um, and Winker, as we know, had some issues um, with, uh, hold on real quick. I'm going to pause the recording. Uh, where is, no, let it go. Oh, there we go. Hold on. We're back. I apologize. Uh, the rest of this trade was um, Mako and Swanson. Uh, Toronto obviously trying to improve their bullpen. Swanson is considered a high leverage reliever. Um, I love him, but he is a reliever that I think the Mariners can reproduce. Uh, so I don't. I don't think that's a huge loss. And then the Mariners are flush with. Um, you know, not elite, but very, very good uh, starting pitching prospects. So losing Adam Mako also was not a, a huge deal, in my opinion. So I look forward to Ta- Teoscar Hernandez hitting, I don't know, somewhere between four and six in the lineup, depending on if we make any other moves. And um, is very exciting for me. Let's take a time, move on to the next one. Yep. Cool. Hunter Renfro to the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. Uh, anything to say about that? Not really. I mean, I think he's the fourth or fifth outfielder. If you need some power, I think the move is a downgrade in my eyes uh, because he's going from a pretty savvy organization to a team that um, was the highest strikeout percentage team in the majors last year. And I know they have a new hitting coach this year. Uh, Nevin brought in that he worked with before. However, um, I know he can, he can be a bit of a free swinger, and I think a little bit of that's contagious. So I'd be worried about him. Sure. Uh, going to that team, um, given he has proclivity to swing this already, we know there's power in the bat, but don't have a lot of confidence uh, in the Angels. And so I see this as a little bit of a downgrade for him. Yeah. And I uh, wouldn't want to rely on him as a starter in a, in a three-team, three-outfielder format, for sure. No, for sure. He's a, he's a fourth, as you said, a fourth or a fifth outfielder in, in fantasy, any, anywhere from a 12 to a 15-team league. Uh, for me... He does provide pretty consistent power. He's had over the last, not counting the COVID year in 20, over the last five years, he's hit no fewer than 26 home runs, but that's literally all he does, right? Um, some runs and RBIs potentially, it depends on where he hits in the lineup. Doesn't really take a walk much. Doesn't strike out as much as you think he would, but um, yeah, just kind of a blah player for me. I was excited to see him go to the Angels because I'm a Mariners fan, and I don't think he's necessarily a winning player. Uh, next one, Jose Abreu to the Houston Astros, three years, 58-5. Um, Abreu replaces Yuli Gurriel. Uh, thoughts on Jose Abreu going to the Angel or Astros? This was probably the early move that I got the most excited about from a fantasy standpoint. Um, mm-hmm. I actually tried uh, pretty unprovably to acquire him just because – uh, I think because he's 36, people might sleep on him a little bit. Um, but given his proclivity uh, for hard contact, for his ability to spray the ball and going to Minimade, where I think he's a good enough hitter where he can, uh, you know, turn and uh, lift the ball to left field 
you know, when he gets a pitch he likes, I think he has that kind of back control that he can and do that. Um, we could see a, you know, a spike in power, but even if he stays in low twenties and home runs, I just would be very surprised if we didn't see some pretty, uh, pretty strong counting stats, uh, mm -hmm. from him batting fourth in that lineup. Again, I know he's 36, but you look at his quality of contact, last year, he showed no signs of uh, degradation, uh, from a quality of contact or play discipline standpoint. So, you know, at 86% zone contact rate. Uh, was his best since uh, 2019, and again just spraying the ball over. His launch angle did go down a little bit, but you know, for his career, he's been more in that 10, 11 percent range. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we've we've talked about I, you. You really carried the banner for him, and I feel like he's someone that I've grown more affectionate of over the last year, and mm -hmm. his ability to drive in runs. Uh, I look at even Yuri Yuli Gurel, who was had very little low ceiling from a fantasy perspective, still provided value. Mm -hmm. uh, just because of that team context and the quality of his putting the ball in play at such a high rate. And I think Abreu, to me, is a – I saw him as a higher skilled, more power, uh, more hit, you know, more ceiling option uh, it's right in the middle of that lineup. So mm -hmm. I think from a fantasy perspective, I just uh, – I, I, I got super excited about it. Um, I'm pretty much on the same page. I think he's he's my number six right now at first base. Um, first base gets really, I, I think, falls off a cliff pretty quickly. Um, it levels out, but but he's a player who, uh, if you're making an upside play, or if you want, uh, if you want a high high floor player with a little, still having a little bit of upside because of the move to Houston, Abreu is a, a good choice. Um, I don't know that he gets too far above. He had 15 home runs last year. I don't know that he gets too far above 20, even hitting with the Crawford boxes. Um, but to your point, I think his RBIs get back over a hundred and, uh, he is going to score runs in that lineup because that lineup is so deep. Um, the only hesitation for me again is, you know, he is to your point, he is probably going to continue with those skills. He's got some, he's got old man skills, if you want to call it that, um, <laughs> you know, bat to ball. It's not athleticism as much as it is bat to ball, uh, eye contact. And he's a strong dude or, uh, yep. excuse me, uh, 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 hand-eye coordination but he's he's th he is 35 so we'll see I expect 90 I expect 90 runs 20 home runs uh 100 RBIs probably a 300 average and a 380 on base and that's not a not a bad player at first base for sure yeah. um did not like seeing that upgrade uh, as a Mariners fan yeah. all right uh next one Mariners traded uh Jesse Winker and Abraham Toro to the Milwaukee Brewers for Colton Wong initial reactions to that trade? Um, I think from a fantasy perspective, there's not a ton of about to get excited about. I think it's wait and see on Winker. He's having two surgeries this off season. Um, so you got to see first and foremost, is he available? Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's going back to the central where he had some success. If you want to bank on that or bank on his uh, track record as a hitter from the left side, particularly against righties, I think there's, you know, enough there to dream on or speculate on. But I think you got to see, I, I would want to see, you know, he's healthy first and foremost. Um, you know, Colton Long going to Seattle, that's the worst part for lefty power. Uh, I know I made jokes about him uh, and his, his effort to hit um, home runs in the Great American Ballpark, but uh, seeing more of in the middle of the order, and he might be someone I think would benefit from the new, uh, adjust the rules on stolen bases. Maybe he can push 15 to 20, um, you know, like a 10, 20 guy, maybe as a ceiling in the middle of the improving Mariners lineup. But I don't think he's going to do anything that's going to, to blow you off, um, to blow your skirt up too much. Um, so kind of a middling, uh, fantasy move for me, but I think it's on par for both of these teams. I mean, the Mar the Brewers are, uh, trying to hit a home run on a hitter who has some track record at low cost. And they're moving away from a player who's in the last year of a contract to get out from under his contract to control, again, to control costs. So right. they kind of play in that middle ground of trying to compete, but also be very cost conscious. So whereas the Mariners are looking for every opportunity to improve everywhere they can. And I think Colton Wong from Adam Frazier to me is an upgrade um, yes. on the field. So I, I smart, again, they're, they're looking every elder moves have said they're trying to get better at it every every opportunity i think he does that for them at second base 
Jesse Winker. So I've gotten, I gotten tons of arguments with friends in Seattle about Jesse Winker. Um, I still think he's a very, very, very good player. Uh, he had a horrible year last year. Granted uh, he was injured. Uh, he's making an adjustment to a new team. I think he is a bit of a prickly guy. Um, we know it came out after the season that there was some conflict between him and the organization and other players down the stretch, which is why he wasn't on the playoff roster. However, his five years in Cincinnati, his OPS were, were his OPS were 904, 836, 830, 932, 949. Okay. He is pretty much a, a strong side platoon player. But when you look strictly at those OPS, regardless of whether he's a good defender or not, he could potentially be an incredibly valuable player for the Brewers, right? Yeah. Um, it's what the Mariners thought they were getting in that trade. Uh, I think it was a, a great risk on the part of the Brewers to pick him up. Um, they saw him play in Cincinnati all those years. I yeah. think they might have a good um, scouting report as to who he is and what he's capable of. So um, I wish him luck. I enjoyed him as a Mariner. I was excited when we made that trade. Uh, I don't know what happened in Seattle. Obviously something did. Uh, I have a slightly different take on Colton Wong. Um, okay. and part of it is the, the rule changes, but I think that he, uh, so last year he became, it, his numbers say that he was trying to be a power hitter, right? Yes. And he changed a bunch of things about his uh, swing and, and batted ball profile last year versus other years. So uh, some of the impact was that he had the highest strikeout rate of the, any year, except for his rookie year at 17.7%. Um, he, let's, let me scroll down real quick. So his launch angle was higher than it ever been at 14 degrees. Uh, his uh, Mac or his average exit velocity was 87 miles an hour, which is not that of a typical home run hitter. Um, his barrel rate was 5.4%, which is not that of a typical home run hitter. Uh, and then he hit 36.8% uh, fly balls, which was the highest um, fly ball uh, percentage of his career as well. He also was, became a pull hitter at 45%, um, which again was highest of his career. So clearly he was trying to yank the ball out, um, kind of become a pull power hitter as a second baseman. What I see from him is, so let me rewind. I think that we know that there are going to be rule changes with two infielders on each side of the diamond. Right. And for extreme pole hitters, there's a chance that um, with the left-handed hitter teams bring their left fielder to play uh, that short right field role. Right. That's the only real uh, uh, shift that teams can make now based on the rules. They're not going to do that for Wong. He's not that much of a dead pole hitter. I think that the rule changes will benefit line drive hitters as well as, as some of those extreme uh, pull ground ball hitters. But I think the Mariners being a smart organization, and I think being an organization that's not teaching everyone to try to yank the ball all the time, I bet you they try to get Wong back to being the, the more of the line drive hitter and um, kind of instigator that he's been uh, earlier in his career. He also teach controlling the zone and taking walks and trying to hit the ball hard when you get your pitch. So I think we'll see more patience from him. I think we'll see him become more of a higher average hitter. And I honestly, I don't expect to see his home runs go down all that much. I think he'll run into 10 home runs. Um, they also encourage, you know, they're not the Kansas city Royals or the 85 St. Louis Cardinals, but they do encourage their players to run when they can. Um, as far as the upgrade to Frazier. Yeah, absolutely. I think he's a much, much better player overall than Adam Frazier, but I think Wong is has a little bit of an up arrow as far as his fantasy value. I think we'd see his steals potentially go up from seven or uh, 17 last year. I definitely think we could see a 270 hitter. He's proven in his career that he can hit 270 pretty consistently. So if you got a 270, 350, uh, you know, 430 or 450 uh slug second baseman with 20 steals and 10 to 15 home runs, I think that's a pretty darn good second baseman. Um, I have him ranked currently in my second base ranks at 12. So he's a low end starter as far as I'm concerned at second base, um, which is slightly higher, I think, than where I had him last year at this point in time. I'm super excited to see him uh, become a Mariner. And I think the Mariners are smart enough to try to get something different out of him. Basically, he's not a, he's not a, a pole home run hitter. And that's what they that's what he tried to do last year. All right. Yeah, I'm on board. I'm on board with the average improvement in the steals, 100. I uh, take the under on the home runs, but we'll oh, see. 
Uh, the other player that went was Abraham Toro. Um, he has some pro prospect pedigree going to the Brewers. He's got some positional flexibility, even if he's not barely average at all at second and third. But um, he's a player like a, a deep, deep league. He might be one to take a flyer on. He's got some power in that bat. Uh, so I'm going to make a quick shift here. I think we should put the pitchers off until uh, next episode and run through okay. the hitters here. Um, yeah. Next hitter is uh, – so Trey Turner to the Phillies, 11 years, $300 million. Uh, uh, reactions to both the contract and uh, the fit in Philly for you? You know, I think Trey and the redraft is, you know, considered a top five pick. Um, and I think, to me, this move is a slight up arrow just in the sense that I mean, what, what else is really going to change? I don't think there's too much that you can really – about his profile. You know, he's a speed, uh, you know, hit tool, a little bit more power than we expected when he was a prospect. But mm -hmm. the reason I like this move slightly better for him is just I see him more as a table setter and his, and his true skills and especially as he ages. Um, can we pause? Yeah. Or is calling me. Yeah, so Trey and Philly, again, I think um, I see this as a slight tip in his value, but it's it's marginal. And he's what he does, he's going to translate on any team that he's on. But I think for me, I see Trey's true skill set as a table setter, mm -hmm. someone who makes a lot of contact, uses his speed, puts the ball in play. You know, we saw a career high chase rate last year. The Dodgers were putting him in a number three spot because Mookie is their lead off hitter. And um, I think Trey is more of the top of the order type player. Mm -hmm. um again using his best skills and um and you know he's gonna hit for some power because he's a good hitter but i i just like that he's going to a team where again he can be more of a top of the order type presence and use his speed um you know the contract was the contract i don't i don't have a lot to add on that um it seems to be the trend they're extending out these longer contracts to spread out the, the annual value um but I think he was the number one first up on the market and he wanted to be on the East coast and um, he got to pick where he wanted to play. So good for him. Is there, is there a difference to you in valuing Trey Turner um, based on where he hits in the order? Fantasy wise. I just think we saw a different approach from him hitting third um, than we've ever seen before. Um, and I just, I think he's best served in terms of his skill when he um, is just trying to get on base and, and drag, you know, and, and make contact and use his speed. So, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, he's a really good, you know, he's a really good hitter. I don't think he's, you know, he's probably like a 55, 60 hit tool. And with mm -hmm. his speed, that's, that's what he needs. And his, his career batting average is 302. I mean, um, that's pretty damn phenomenal. Yeah. I wonder if, so I like him as, I like him a bit more at the top of the order if he's running. Cause just because I, I, as we know, steals are so hard to come by. And that's, that is a major reason to draft Trey Turner is, is that he runs as much as he does and he's successful as much as he is. Um, I'd rather see a, a 40, 50 stolen base, 20 home run guy. Um, than a 25 home run guy with 25 steals, right? I think those are more right. common. Um, interestingly, uh, his, yeah, you're right. His swing profile did change, right? He had a 33.1% uh, O swing last year, which was 4% uh, higher, almost 4% higher than any other year. So he chased a lot more uh, pitches out of the zone. He looked, it almost looks like he's pressing based on his, uh, he was pressing based on his, um, his uh, plate discipline. He uh, his zone swing was seventy one point one percent. Had never been above seventy percent. So he's swinging, just swinging more often than he had historically. Um, and then his uh, his swinging strike rate was higher last year at twelve point eight percent than it's ever been. So you could make the case that he was pressing. He's hitting at a different place in the order. You could make the case that he was pressing because he was becoming a free agent. Um, you could also wonder if uh, he is aging at all, right? Or if there was right. any sort of fatigue because he does play a lot. He plays a demanding yeah. defensive position. 
and he will be uh, in his, I guess it's still his age 29 year, but he's played a lot of games, right? Over the last, uh, starting in 18, 162 games, 122 games, COVID year, 148 games, 160 games. Um, mm -hmm. So he looks like he can press a little bit. Uh, my reaction to the contracts is, you you kind of pointed it out that people are freaking out over the um, the total number and, and the number of years, but really it's it's about spreading out the as you said spreading out the ad, average annual value. His AAV, I believe, is just over twenty seven million a year. And if you can compete and add other pieces to that team because you're paying Trey Turner twenty seven million right now, you don't mind paying him at the end of that contract. I also think he has the skills to battle age pretty well um, moving forward. Uh, love it for Philly. I think Philly got pretty lucky and get picking him up going from Bryson Stott to Trey Turner is pretty darn cool for Philly fans. Yeah, uh, next, next player, Josh Bell to Cleveland, two years, 33 million. Uh, Josh Naylor's already there. As we know, uh, what's your reaction to that? It's interesting. I was a little bit more neutral on this than uh -huh. most of the reactions I've seen. Everyone uh, not everyone, but it seems to be that a lot of people were excited about this move. And I don't know if it's just they're excited about the Guardians spending a little bit in free agency, which I think certainly should be uh, acknowledged, but I think there's also no reason they couldn't do more of that. Um, they're not poor, no matter what they say. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, uh, I think Josh Bell, to me, is Josh Bell. I mean, we've seen him in Pittsburgh. We've seen him in San Diego. We've seen him in Washington. Those are very different uh, ballparks, and we've seen him uh, do well and we've had him have extended out time he's a streaky guy you know he struggles a little bit with launch angle we also know he has great play discipline he makes a lot of contact and we know he has real power so um, I would be more interested in him in a in a roto league where you get all of his stats because you know at the end of the year he's going to bank some some pretty good power numbers a pretty good batting average but in a head-to-head -head weekly format to me that's where he's a little bit more of a challenge just because of his streaky nature. And I think we've seen that for the last three or four years. That's kind of just who he is. Um, but I mean, I like him as a player um, because of, again, his contact and his approach. And he's a fun watch and fun to root for. And he's worked hard on his defense. And I love to see guys that are trying to get better. And it'll make the Guardians a little bit better. Uh, and it gives them an opportunity to sit Naylor against lefties. Um, he's giving them nothing against lefties. Mm -hmm. um, and so they can really use him uh in in his where he has the most offer and where his strengths are. So um between first base and DH, I think those two will get most of the at bats there. Mm -hmm. But they need more they needed power and he kind of gives them some power without compromising the things that they're really good at and the things that kind of their identity is based on in yep. terms of contact and things like that. His uh his splits last year he had 121 WRC plus against lefties and 127 against righties. Um, pretty even splits down the board. Looks like a little bit more power against right-handed pitching, but um, nevertheless, I think a great pickup, as you pointed out, uh, to pair with Naylor. Um, the one thing I'll add with Bell is I do think, so he's my number 12 first baseman, so back-end starting first baseman uh, in fantasy. I think his, so his, obviously his profile fits uh, Cleveland like a glove, right? They look for those high contact uh, players, put the players put the ball in play. Um, he struck out 15.8% of the time, which is just above Freddie Freeman and below uh, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. as far as strikeout rate goes. So that gives you an idea of how often he puts the ball in play. He's got a sub 30% O swing um, and an 8.8% swinging strike rate last year. So he fits them, um, as I said, like a glove. What I like about that is if Cleveland is focused on this type of hitter and they're looking for hitters with this profile, is there more, can Cleveland provide him with a little bit more um, uh, teaching and uh, coaching to get him to take yet another step forward, right? Uh, I think right. that they're very good at at getting the most out of this type of hitter. So it would not surprise me to see his average go up slightly. It wouldn't surprise me to see him hit for more power. He obviously has in the past. Um, I don't think they're going to mess with his launch angle all that much, even though it isn't optimal, just because I think they like the results they're already getting from him. 
if if, it, if I was a, a Guardians fan, I'd be excited to have Bell and Naylor as my two kind of rotating between first base and DH. I thought it was a pretty cool signing. Uh, next yeah, one. Agreed. Cody Bellinger. One year, $17.5 million to the Chicago Cubs. Uh, at first glance, what did you think? Fantasy-wise, I think this is an up arrow because it's an opportunity. It's a, it's a clear runway for an opportunity. You know, they have Pete Armstrong in high A. He's probably their center fielder of the future, but he's not going to be coming up this year. Um, and so I think Bellinger has a year to try to reestablish himself. Um, you know, how much of this is psychological, how much of it is his shoulder, um, you know, how much of it is just, you know, the pressure of being the MVP and then not meeting expectations. You know, it's hard to say, kind of like with Winker. We don't really know what these guys are going through in their lives and, right. you know, injury-wise. But um, I think from a fantasy perspective, you know, he still provides speed and now he has playing time. And so if any of the contact or power comes back, you know, and he has a full assortment of plane appearances, you know, um, there's an opportunity there for him to, to really be an asset. And, but again, I think, you know, 550, 600 plane appearances, when you have this kind of speed and you play every day, it's something fantasy wise, it's going to have some value. Mm -hmm. Or as well if he stayed with LA, um, if they had, you know, uh, given him a qualifying offer, I don't know that he would have played every day based on the trajectory he was on with that team last year. Right. His, uh, just his numbers just say he needs to swing a little bit more level and not swing as much essentially. Right. It's, yeah. it seems, and it seems really, you know, kind of flippant and simple to say, uh, say it in that way, but that's what his numbers say to me. Um, there's not going to be any less pressure on him being in Chicago. Maybe his the expectations are slightly lower, but Cubs fans are intense, right? Probably more acutely intense than Dodgers fans are. Um, and they're going to have expectations of him. So it'll be interesting to see if he gets off to a good start and has some confidence. I think that he'd be a good player to target in fantasy because there is um, there. Obviously there is tremendous. There's 40 home run upside there, 50 home run upside damn near. Um, one thing to point out with him is he was, he was horrible, right? 210, 265, 389, triple slash. Uh, but he still provided 19 home runs, 70 runs, 68 RBIs, and 14 steals. This offense is not as good, obviously, in Chicago as it was in LA, but it's not, you know, if he's your, if you're in a five outfielder league and he's your, your OF5, he's got OF1 potential. And I think he's worth taking that flyer in our league where we have, three outfielders in a utility, you do not want to count on him as your OF3, right? Um, but right. having him on your roster and kind of holding on to see what happens, uh, I would I would take that that flyer at a uh, um, at a minimal cost. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, next one, Mitch Hanniger to the Giants, three years, 43 and a half million. Uh, how does Mitch Hanniger fit in San Francisco? Uh, I think he fits in left field. Um... They're not going to have him play center. Um, but, I mean, I think they're they're banking on him being healthy here. Let me try to pull him up here. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I believe Ridey, uh, Ridey, the park factor for Ridey's and Giants uh, Oracle Park is actually better than people think. It's really lefty power that gets suppressed there. Uh, they're actually 10th in, in, in right-handed park factor. Mm -hmm. um, so he brings a little bit more power and ceiling uh to that outfield, um, which was, you know, pretty atrocious defensively last year outside of uh, Jock Peterson. So um, I'm sorry, Jock Peterson offensively. Uh, he's not an asset defensively. I misspoke right. there. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Mitch, we, we know he, we know he's a, a big league ball player when he is healthy, but right. health is the loose support. Right. I think we talked about Cleveland and Bell, maybe being able to, to bring you know, something forward out of Bell. We know, the Giants are one of the teams that are the most advanced in terms of advanced medicine and preventive medicine, uh, looking at the recovery and things like that and getting, uh, keeping and getting guys healthy. And so if they're, you know, that's a great thing for, for I think for Hanniger, if there is a team that maybe could figure out, you know, what is the playing time pattern, where, are the, you know, where are the, the uh, remedies for preventing some of the soft tissue injuries or whatever the case may right. be. I think the Giants are a team that's demonstrated they do a 
pretty dang good job of trying to get their guys on the field. So, you know, we'll see. Um, he's an interesting player uh, to speculate on. Uh, where is he fantasy wise for you? I think he's in outfield five or six. Okay. Meaning he doesn't start on any. Not to start the, no, not to start the year. No, I wouldn't want to rely on him. So this is probably blasphemous for me to say as a Mariners fan, everybody loves Mitch Hanniger, you know, his heartbeat of the team for a while there. Uh, I don't think he's very good. I'm not saying it because he's gone now. I'm saying it because I just don't think he's very good. Even his year. So in 21, he hit 253, 318, 485, which at first glance doesn't look great, but he had 39 home runs, 110 runs and 100 RBIs. Uh, he did it because he had 691 plate appearances. Um, it was a volume play. Uh, it was the Marcus Simeon season, right? Where you just accumulate enough plate appearances that you put up counting stats. It's great for fantasy, but um, he's only stayed healthy two out of the last four years. He, for me, is a 250, you know, 310, 450 type of hitter. Uh, he's, I think he's going to be league, pretty much league average moving forward. Um, his, Offense will be a little bit ahead of his defense. I think he'll start in right field for 140 games for the Giants if he stays healthy. Um, you know, fantasy wise, I think if he's if he does get back closer to where he was in 21, he's an outfield three for me. Uh, I don't think he's going to get there. He also doesn't provide any speed, so right. uh, he falls to me. He falls in that uh, Hunter Renfro, Teoscar Hernandez category as a corner outfielder but with uh a spotted injury history um maybe a little more upside than Renfro and a little bit less of a player than Tail Scar for me uh San Francisco I trust them and it'll be interesting to see what they can get out of them but uh I was I was glad that the Mariners did not sign him to any sort of extension in the way that the fans were uh, clamoring for I actually had a friend text me um who's not a huge baseball fan and ask if the Mariners were purposely tearing down the team because they got rid of Hanager and Toro and Frazier. And I had to gently explain that all those players needed to go. <laughs> um, so next one was the biggest contract. It was Aaron judge to the giants, nine years, 360 million. Uh, fantasy wise, we know what he's, what he's capable of. He had one of the greatest fantasy years of all time. You could make the case that uh, probably outside of Bonds, best year is probably the best fantasy year of all time. Um, any thoughts other than the stuff that we've already heard everyone else say? Not really. I mean, I think it's compelling to see where he'll be going in redraft and how uh, you know fantasy players will value him. Steamer has him for ten steals and forty three home runs, mm -hmm. uh, over hundred runs in RBI. Which mm -hmm. if he gets six hundred sixty five plate appearances like they project, he probably will do that. Um, pardon me, that was the fan graphs projection, not steamer. I misspoke. Um, but they're both pretty close, you yep. know, 40 low 40s home runs, 10 steals. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if he runs that much again, fantasy wise, uh, now that he has his contract. Um, and also if he can post that many plate appearances again, you know, he's done a good job of staying healthy the last couple of years and he's changed some of the things he's done off the field in terms of stretching and things to try to make that a reality. So, um, we have to give him uh, the benefit of the doubt there. But, yeah, it's interesting to see where he'll go. Uh, I'm interested to see how much he runs. But, yeah, I think it's pretty much status quo, staying in that park and staying on that team. He's obviously going to be the face of that franchise uh, for the next 10 years. Where do you pick him in, in uh, TGFBI? Oh, boy. I haven't really thought about that. Um I would love to pair him with someone else as my second pick as my outfield one. Sure. Uh, but uh, I don't, I don't think that would be an option. I don't. Right. Let's do a little, uh, would you rather, would okay. you rather Aaron judge or Jose Ramirez? Jose Ramirez. Aaron judge or Juan Soto. Judge. Judge or. Ronald Acuna. Acuna. Judge or Trey Turner. 
Wow, you're getting such different things. That's a good one. Right. Um, I'd probably take the shortstop over the outfielder. Two That's more. close. Judge or Julio Rodriguez? Judge. Judge or – I know your answer. Judge or Bobby Witt Jr.? Judge. Okay. It's interesting though, right? I think he's probably he's pretty squarely in that top five, I would say. Um, I do think we'll see some variance in where he's picked draft to draft. I think you could see him as high as one and as low as I could make the case as low as seven or eight, right? Uh I might consider wit over him uh because of the uh speed potential and because of the the injury potential with judge, but um I'd be I know I'd be in the minority with that, but uh, it'll be interesting to see where he goes. Um, I'm happy for Yankees fans. I don't like Yankees fans typically, but I'm happy that I'm glad he stayed there. I think it would, would have been weird to see him go elsewhere. Uh, never been a favorite player of mine, but I'm glad he's there. He's a good villain. Um, and obviously put up a historic year last year. Uh, one that hurt me a little bit. Wilson Contreras to St. Louis, five years, 87-5. I don't know. I, I'm, I wouldn't call myself a Cubs fan. Um, a lot of family in Chicago. Uh, grandfather grew up in Gary, Indiana. Grandmother grew up in Chicago. I lived there for a couple of years. Went to college in the Midwest, obviously. Um, I love going to Cubs games. Contreras in a Cardinals uniform just kind of sucks, right? Like, for especially for Cubs fans. Uh, never thought he would have signed there. Uh, love Chicago so much. Uh, from a fantasy um, point of view, I think he's a one of those. I, to me, he's becoming one of those who has really great batted ball um, metrics, but it doesn't always prove out in his production. Last year, he had 22 home runs, uh, 65 runs, 55 RBIs, four steals, hit 243 with the 815 OPS. I love the obviously the the above 800 OPS is great. Um, his OPS was higher than Rutschman. It was higher than Will Smith. It was higher than Barsho. It was higher than Salvador Perez. Um, the only, his brother was above him at 860. And then um, you had Stevenson with limited at bats and Jansen above him as well. And then Real Muto at 820. So is he a top for me? I actually ranked him all the way down at nine. Um, I, I may move him up a little bit. Uh, I don't know. Depends on whether St. Louis uh, brings up Yvonne Herrera and has him catch a bit um, to take some of the wear and tear off of Contreras. I think the plan is probably to get him some DH at bats as well, which will yeah. be good for his fantasy stats. But um, while I love how hard he hits the ball, I just think he's kind of mired in a, in a 20 home run, um, you know, 70 runs, 70 RBI type of place, which makes him uh, fungible. I think, you know, he's in the same place with D'Arno and, and his brother and Sean Murphy and Kyle Raleigh, if you want to take a little more power and a little less average, uh, Alejandro Kirk, MJ Melendez, I think they're all in that same bucket. Um, I wouldn't value him too, too high. As a fan, like I said, I don't like seeing him in St. Louis at all. <laughs> Why do you think he doesn't get more out of his quality of contact? Because you're right. He has four straight years of a double-digit barrel rate, a hard hit rate of a 45%. Mm -hmm. I mean, he consistently does all the things from a hard quality of contact standpoint. Why is he not getting more power out of that? Uh, line drive, or excuse me, um, ground ball and launch angle, I think, are the two that, that pop for me. He had a 51.4% ground ball rate last year and a – an 8.5 degree launch angle. Um, I think he's hitting the ball. In the, he may benefit from the uh, from the shift rules quite a bit. He hit the ball. Um, so his hit 44 percent um, pull rate, 32, 31 seven um, up the middle, and 23 eight uh, oppo. He, I just think he's. Any player like that that hit the ball on the ground and hit line drives is probably going to benefit a bit from from the um, inhibiting shifts. But I, to me, that's what it is, right? If his launch angle was 12, I think you'd see a 25 home run hitter. That's pretty clear. Uh, so again, he's in that in that 
kind of mid area of he's not Will Smith, JT Real Muto, or Adley Rutschman. Um, he's in the next tier for me, fantasy wise. Anything else with Wilson Contreras? No, it's interesting that roster resource has him penciled in number two. Um, that obviously would be a boon for his his counting stats, mm-hmm. um, given what he just read what he had last year. So, um, I, the, bet the I bet we see him at six. Yeah, I, I put I mean, my money that he hits at hits six or seven. Um, Matsutaka Yoshida, uh, left-handed hitter, going corner outfielder, going to the Red Sox from Japan, five years, ninety million. Initial thoughts? Any uh, research done on on Yoshida? A little bit. Um, you know, he is a bat first uh, outfielder. My understanding is very little or marginal defensive value. Mm-hmm. Um, he has had a couple twenty home run seasons in the NPB, but that's not really his calling card. It's his play discipline, his contact ability. Um, he regularly strike out, strikes out. A fraction uh, in comparison to his blocks, mm-hmm. and he puts uh, tons of balls in play and hits for a very high average. So, um, kind of your prototypical leadoff hitter uh, in a, in a non sabermetric sense. I would expect an adjustment period. I think we've um, even with what even Otani uh, when he came over uh, wasn't the Otani that we know now. In the first couple of years. Right. Um, you know, if you look at uh, Hassan Kim and his sort of arc, I think so, you know, in a year or two, maybe a year and a half, um, see what Seiya Suzuki does this year. I expect, you know, maybe him to take a step forward. Just a big change on the field and off the field. Um, an intriguing sort of leadoff hitter type profile. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely be watching, speed. but I, I wouldn't be bought in for this year. I wonder if he uh, – I'd love to see his spray charts. And I wonder – because you can't – hitting the ball to right field in Boston is not great. Um, but if he is – say he's an opposite hit, opposite field hitter, right, or he has some of that slap that you would, you see in softball typically from a, a fast left-handed hitter. Um, if he has some of that and he can slap the ball off the wall, I do think that will be – that would be interesting. Um I also think that we're, we've gotten so, so good at scouting that, you know, signing a 29 year old player from Japan and putting him at the top of your lineup, but expecting a year adjustment. I don't know if they're, I, I bet you Boston is expecting production right away. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, we haven't seen great results from this type of hitter coming from Japan. Right. Uh, we saw, what was his name? The second baseman that went to the Mets had a bit of this profile. Um, uh, was it, Akayama, the um, uh, center fielder for the Reds that came over, that was left-handed. Yeah, Shogo. Yeah, Shogo yeah. Akayama. The mm-hmm. one, you know, we saw Matsui obviously was great, right? But he was a power hitter, not a slap hitter. The one hitter we saw that had the, some of this profile was Ichiro. But that's like saying, uh, you know, a six-six basketball player that can jump is Michael Jordan. There's right. only one Michael Jordan. I think there's only one Ichiro. So. Right. It'll be interesting to see. I, I don't know what Boston is doing as an organization right now. I think a lot of people have said that. I'm rooting yeah. for Yoshida. I like that type of player. I think it's fun. Um, and I don't think the risk was much for the Red Sox to go ahead and sign him. Uh, next player on our list is was a shock to me. Xander Bogert's going to the San Diego Padres 11 years, $280 million, which was just 20, same years and $20 million less than Trey Turner. Uh, the analysis on this signing has been all over the board. Uh, what say you, Aaron, about Xander Bogert's going to the Padres? You know, I heard, I've heard speculation or people assessing the free agent class and saying that he was the fourth best hitter amongst the group uh, for free agents. I, I disagree with that. Um, I think Xander is the best average hitter. Uh, the best he's probably been one of the most consistent hitters uh at his position the last four or five years. Mm-hmm. Um and I just think he's a little bit underrated. Um he's never posted a K rate um since his uh age twenty two season above twenty percent. Um yeah, and you look at his career, his career batting average is two ninety two, mm-hmm. three fifty six, four fifty eight. Um a little bit of a park downgrade, but a, a lineup upgrade. 
you know, defensively, he had a better season last year, according to the, uh, the metrics, which I think we all can argue about which ones are the right ones and how much value to place on those. But clearly the Padres and their front office saw enough of him defensively to make him the shortstop. Um, I just think he's a good all around hitter. He's not going to hit 35 home runs. He's not going to steal 35 bases, but quality hitter and a quality lineup. And uh, he's just a really good hitter. I think he's underrated. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's batting cleanup, uh, or at least he's penciled in the back cleanup. So right. I think an uptake for his fancy value for 2023 and how he ages, um, how he ages over this contract will be something to be seen. But I think with his, you know, could he be like Jose Abreu in, in three or four years? So when we look at Jose Abreu, someone who's sitting 18 to 20 home runs and and driving 100 runs, absolutely, I think he could. I love I love that comp. I think that that's a, a very, very good comp, a professional hitter, a hitter that I think will age well. Uh, Fantasy-wise, I don't expect too, too much different than what he's done um, over his career with Boston. Uh, better lineup, he's aging a little bit. I think the one thing about him is I want to love him as a fantasy player because I really like him as a real life player. I don't think he's a great fantasy player at this point in time. Um, I have not done my shortstop ranks yet, but I don't think he's going to be too, too high. I think he has a high floor and a low ceiling, quite honestly. Um, But I do think his, the real life impact on the Padres is huge. I think that, um, they have a lot of really great players, but I don't know that they seemed a bit rudderless at times as a team, even with Soto coming in, right? Like Machado's a leader. I love Machado. He's a bit of a hothead. Um, He's tough. He can go, you know, kind of off the rails once in a while. Obviously Tatis is Tatis. He's young. Um, Soto comes in and he's kind of, you know, he's a great player and a great guy, but I don't know that he's that, stand-up kind of guy Bogertz was very clearly the leader in Boston and yes. brings some a ton of stability right he his games played from 14 were 144 156 157 148 136 155 COVID year 144 150 right he's healthy he comes to the plate he plays an average shortstop right now he probably moved to third he's also insurance for Bo, or for Machado if Machado leaves Machado has an opt right. this year right correct yep the last thing is if you're worried about Tatis and you're worried about Tatis getting hurt and you want Tatis to have a mentor, right? Or you think you need to rein him in a little bit off the field. Now he has no argument to play shortstop, right? He has to go play center field because now you have Xander Bogarts. And I, I think that it's, it has a really positive impact on a lot of the players all around him. I think that Machado is more likely to resign there with a player of Bogarts caliber at short. Um, I love it for the Padres. I, I love seeing teams go out there and do that. I, um, he's a player that I've always loved from a baseball standpoint, but I don't know that he's going to be much more than a, I haven't, like I said, I haven't done my shortstop ranks yet, but I bet you he's no higher than eight for me, um, next year. All right. Next one. Uh, Brandon Nimmo, New York Mets, eight years, $162 million. Uh, why? Honestly, uh, why? Why? I have no reasonable answer. Um, they're just want to have the highest payroll. I, I, can Can I say I'm saying why? As someone who has touted on base percentage for literally almost thirty years now, playing dynasty baseball as a high schooler, right? Freshman year, I'm the one who's gathering all of the on-base percentage guys. I want Hal Morris and I for the Reds, and I want Jerry Brown, who was the second baseman for the Rangers, because they had a high on-base percentage. I want a Dave Magadin, first baseman for the Mets, right, who had no power but walked. Like, I love on-base percentage. I hate Brandon Nimmo. Yeah. I don't I don't get it. And I also don't, fantasy-wise, I don't think he's that much of a player either. I, I get that he had a... a uh, 800 OPS last year, barely, but he hasn't, a, he, he's just not for me, he's not my cup of tea. He's not going to drive. Yeah. He's not going to drive guys in. He's not going to steal bases. He's not going to hit 20 home runs. Last year he provided 102 runs, but that was the first year he was above 77 runs. Yeah. 
and they gave him $162 million? Yeah, I guess, I guess they're bet. I guess they're betting betting that he's on the come. I did, yeah, it's, you know, sixteen home runs and three steals last year, and he had six hundred seventy three plate appearances. So that's he's never going to do that again. He, mm -hmm. His track record of health, you know. So if that's his peak season in terms of plate appearances, it was sixteen and three. Uh, yes, he scored one hundred and two runs, and that's a category that helps. But again, that was a volume based result, driven by the fact, as you said, he does get on base at a good clip. Right. Uh, you know, his his defense has improved over his career. Um, obviously, teams pay for defense up the middle. Um, but I that was, seems like a one – is that just a one-year spike or is that sustainable, again, given his proclivity to have injuries? But it's not even a, it's it, not even a spike, right? Like it's going from shitty to average. It's literally not a spike. It's the one skill he has is being able to take a walk. Yeah. I don't know. I would you rather him or Bellinger at one year, 17 million Bellinger, right? Would you rather have him or Kiermaier at one year? What is it? 8 million or something like that. Right. I take cool. Kiermaier if it's, if it's outfield defense. Um, I don't know. I, I didn't, I hated the signing. Obviously I think it was stupid. And for a team that's laying out that much money, that's the one place. If you're looking for center field defense and a little bit of on base percentage, that's the one place you could go find freaking Chuck Carr or, you know, any sort of, there's so many alternatives. Uh, all right. Off that soapbox real quick. Um, we're going to skip pitchers. Let's move to uh, the big trade before we take a break. We'll talk about the big trade between Atlanta, Milwaukee, and the Oakland A's. Sean Murphy went from the athletics to the Braves the Athletics got Manny Pena, Estuary Ruiz, left-handed pitcher Kyle Mueller, uh, Freddie Tarnock, uh, Royber Salinas. Uh, Salinas and Tarnock and Mueller, or Mueller were um, minor league pitchers. Mueller with the most pedigree there. And to the Brewers went uh, William Contreras um, and then two relief pitchers. Uh Initial reaction to that trade, but really from a fantasy standpoint, we're talking about Murphy going to the Braves, Ruiz and Mueller going to the Athletics, and Contreras going to the Brewers. Yeah, I think for Murphy, it's the slight downgrade because he's not going to get the plate appearances that he got in Oakland last year that drove his, you know, his fantasy value. Um, I thought it was interesting. Clearly, the Athletics didn't want. I don't say didn't want, but. I find it hard to believe if they wanted Contreras that Milwaukee would have got involved. Um, so it's interesting that Milwaukee valued uh, Contreras, whereas Oakland clearly wanted more. You know, they're they're rebuilding, they're retooling, they're doing what they do. They want they want volume, right? They want multiple players. They want more lottery tickets. They want more guys, uh, more pieces, um, and that's what they got in this deal. They got five or six players as you listed them all out. Um, you know, Mueller, who's had command issues, but has showed some flashes, a couple other guys that may have reliever risk, um, but due to command issues, but we know that they get the most out of their pitchers. So um, they like guys that have deep arsenals and teach them, you know, how to command them. So, um, yeah, that was the most interesting piece for me. I thought there, as we talked about offline, Murphy was a little bit of an overreaction just because, again, I think his playing time is going to go down a little bit and we probably just saw his peak season already. Uh, and it was interesting to me that Milwaukee wedged in and grabbed Contreras, a guy who, uh, while he swings and misses a little bit and just chase a little bit, also has shown some real power uh, and is, in a, I think, an ascendant young catcher in, in that sense, um, going to a team that has point time at catcher. Um, he might be the most interesting fantasy catcher of this group for 2023. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not a huge Murphy fan. I currently have him at 10. I have Wilson Contreras at nine. Uh, I think Murphy is a great baseball player, right? Good defensively um, by all accounts. But yeah, he had 18 home runs and 612 plate appearances last year, and he didn't break 70 runs or RBIs. I get Oakland is not a great defense or a great offense, but um, that's not great, right? He hit 250. Um Park change will definitely impact him positively because Oakland is such a horrible hitters park. Uh, again, the interesting one for me is Contreras. I do think that there was some luck involved, right, with Contreras. His um, launch angle is 8.5 degrees. 
Um, you could make the case that he hit 22 home runs, despite the fact that he uh, had a launch angle of, of 8.5 degrees, but um, he had a 51.4% ground ball rate last year as well. So there's some tweaks that need to happen with Contreras to get, excuse me, I'm looking at Wilson. I apologize on my list. William had a 6.1 degree launch angle and had a 53% ground ball rate. So even um, more work to be done to get him to a place where um, I think these numbers are, are consistent as far as his production. Uh, one thing about William Contreras is that he had a, a set from what I see a 77.5% zone contact rate. Um, I know we look at two different um, rates for that. I think the uh, no matter what number you're looking at, it's still sub eight, 80%, right? Which is not right. optimal. He's tons of swing and miss in his profile, hits yeah. the ball on the ground. Um, he may not be that good moving forward. Right. This could have been his best year, his breakout. I do think we are uh, overrating Contreras a little bit right now and his acquisition. Um, I am most interested, honestly, in Asturi Ruiz and Kyle Mueller and how they'll perform in uh, Oakland. So getting back to Nimmo real quick, what would it have cost the Mets to trade to acquire Asturi Ruiz? Right. And let Nimmo go. Because Ruiz is a high on-base percentage, fast, um, currently not a great center fielder, but he can play center field and make up for some of his deficiencies with speed, right? And they could have saved, what is it, $162 million in acquiring him. And obviously the cost was not that high. I like, fantasy-wise, Ruiz is a player that I would take a flyer on everywhere. He's the, he's the centerpiece to this trade for Oakland, meaning he's going to get probably 500, at least 500 plate appearances this year and he had 85 steals last year in the minor leagues so if you're looking for a player that um to boost steals and potentially hit 10 home runs he can do that right um i'm excited to see him play i think he could have multi-positional eligibility as well um he plays a you know like a 45 uh infield and a and a 50 outfield and then kyle muller is a player i rostered for i think one start last year um, he kind of tampered down his control issues. I think you said that, uh, when he came up last year and he fits that profile of a, uh, mid middle rotation starter going to Oakland, uh, pitching in a big park, the, those types of uh, pitchers that Oakland likes to acquire, uh, anything else on this trade from you? No. All right. A couple more hitters and then we'll be done. We'll come back with pitchers for the next episode. Uh, Mike Zanino goes to Cleveland one year, 6 million. Any interest fantasy wise for you and Mike Zanino? No. All right. He may hit 25 home runs, man. You never know. I, uh, I loved him. What was it? 2000 and was it 19 or 20? Um, I, I enjoyed having him on my team. He was shitty everywhere, but home runs, but he hit a ton of home runs for me that year. Uh, it was, it was 21. Yeah. Carlos Correa, 13 years, $350 million from the San Francisco Giants to be the uh, cornerstone of their franchise. We've had conversations back and forth about Correa. We valued him as our D play middle infield for us in um, yeah. TGPI. Uh, yes. The knock on Correa fantasy wise is that he doesn't steal bases. Um, how do you feel about Correa now? I still value him just the same as I have done in the past in terms of the quality of hitter that he is. You saw what he did in the second half last year uh, once he got healthy with Minnesota. It's back to being himself. So I'm trying to pull up his splits. Um, I've got it. Second hit. half. Yeah, second half. Uh, last year, he hit uh, 304. 304, uh, 384, 86 with the 866 uh, OPS and a 149 WRC+. plus. Yeah. Uh, but he wasn't able to, to pull that team to a playoff spot. Uh, you know, San Francisco overall, we know we talked about Mitch Hanninger. If, I think they've had a disappointing offseason. Um, but I think, as you said, he's going to be the centerpiece there and hopefully some other prospects. Uh, and the upper minors are to 
come to fruition in the next two to three years because I look at the lineup that's currently constructed. I don't think it's a great uh, fantasy lineup. Um, and so that's going to affect him a little bit. But I think if I had him in a keeper or dynasty, um, you know, he's, he's got security now and he's a great hitter. So not going to run, as you said. It's hard to not get any steals from your shortstop. Mm-hmm. But there are other ways you can still compete. It's not a death knell. Um, as someone who rosters Corey Seager, you know, I have to construct my team that way. It can be done. So, um, yeah, I like Ray a lot. And, you know, the Giants finally got one. And like I said, I just would like to see the lineup get better around him. I know they were in on a lot of guys. Um, but he, I look at their lineup and it's still pretty uninspiring. So I've got a little bit of a different take. Um, I do love the signing of Correa. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, they can print money in San Francisco if they have an exciting team. Uh, I think he provides, he makes the, obviously makes the off season for them. Um, he provides incredible defense at short. He provides leadership uh, as a player, strictly as a player. I, I think he's a good, not a great shortstop um, offensively. Again, from a fantasy standpoint, he's probably a notch below Bogertz for me. They'll probably be back to back. I think their their offense is underrated, honestly. Um, and we'll like, I feel like every year they they produce slightly over what we expect from them, right? You get a, a big streak from Lamont Way Jr. Uh, Jock Peterson is one of the best left-handed power hitters in the game, whether we realize that or not. Tyro Estrada had a great year from a uh, power and speed standpoint. Um, and I love what they did with their pitching. I think that Ross Stripling and Sean Mania were incredible pickups at the cost and um, will be very, very good middle rotation starters. And I, tr- I trust what they do with their pitching. Um, they've got Kyle Harrison coming up. I, I think they made very giant sort of moves and understood that they needed a centerpiece to sell to the fans. Um, and Correa was going to be that guy for them. So uh, I love it. I think that it was smart. They had to spend their money somewhere. I think they preferred Judge. Um, but I, I don't think they're going to necessarily beat out the Dodgers or the Padres this year. But I do think they have a sneaky 90-win team, potentially. Um, even with, you know, when you look at the names, they don't really pop on paper. Uh, but, yeah, I I love seeing Correa in San Francisco. I think it's cool. I think he's got a bit of swag. I think that town has a bit of swag. Um, I just remember – by going to, I've been to a number of Giants games. My daughter is a huge Giants fan and they all wore the Pedro uh, or Pablo Sandoval hats, the Panda hats, right? And literally half the stands had Panda hats on and the stands were full and it was super fun. And I think signing Correa does some of that for the organization again. It brings back a little bit of pop. Um, So I'm super, super excited to see that. Uh, Let's end this portion uh, of the pod with Adam Frazier going to Baltimore one year, 8 million. Do you have anything to say about Adam Frazier going to Baltimore? Cause I don't. No, I really don't. Uh, I think fantasy wise, he's a, he's a look the other way and probably be a utility, <laughs> uh, utility guy for them. Did you say look the other way? I did. <laughs> I love it. Uh, one of the most disappointing uh, player acquisitions for the Mariners that I've ever experienced. 602 plate appearances last year for Seattle, three home runs, 61 runs, 42 RBIs, 11 stolen bases. He hit 238, 301, 311. And he had a negative 13.1 offensive war by Fangrass and an 81 WRC plus. Uh, to go from him to Colton Wong, I think is a huge upgrade for the Mariners and good riddance to Adam Frazier. I did roster him for quite, uh, quite a while in our league as well. Uh, any pitchers you want to hit real quick or are we good um, to, to do pitchers next time? I'm good to do them next time. Do you have any, uh, any other baseball thoughts you want to share? No, I don't. I'm interested to see what the rest of this month holds. Um, if it seems like it's getting kind of quiet, mm-hmm. um, and uh, you know, speculation of some trades might happen or this, that, and the other. But um, yeah, I'm just anxious to see if we have more movement or if it's going to get quiet. 
Um, I, I hope it doesn't um, because when it gets quiet, it makes the days get really slow as we move towards spring training. But hey, we have something to look forward to as we move towards spring training. But right um, about to approach the uh, the dog days mid mid January, all the projection systems will be out. Uh, and that'll be start working on that. So have that to look forward to. Are you uh, working on any projects right now? Anything baseball related that you're doing? Um, no, I'm not really. Little any uh, no outside the park. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I am. I am messing around with that. Um, must say, on my breaks from work or like while I'm eating my meal, I will pull it up. But uh, I am. I am doing that. Yes, out of the park baseball. Um, perfect team is what I've been messing around with um it's a card based simulation it's uh, pretty addicting pretty fun i've learned a lot about historical players which i valued immensely um but uh and it's a good competitive outlet for me essentially every night i turn on my computer after you know getting ready for work and sleeping and comparing to be up for a third shift and see how my team did that month um nice. and then make adjustments you know and then go for the next month and then the playoffs are every Sunday if you make the playoffs. Awesome. So um, it's, uh, yeah, it kind of gives your week like a pacing. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, or at least it has. Um, and again, it's a good competitive outlet. And um, yeah. I love seeing the uh, the Eric Davis card that you sent that you're trying to acquire because <laughs> he was, I mean, we've talked about this. He's one of my, my top, he's at least top five, maybe top three favorite players of all time. And I miss him. I miss him a lot. I, I do, honestly. I miss everything. The stance, the way he played, all of it. It was awesome. Um, so that made my night to see that car. That was pretty cool. It was very cool. Yeah. Um, so I started, uh, I've started a bunch of my my spreadsheet stuff, which has been really fun. Um, starting it in Excel, uh, just kind of taking the, what I feel like are the most pertinent stats. Eventually I'll put it into my sequel so I can sort it in the way that I want to. But for now I've made it through catcher, first base, second base, and third base, um, doing, doing some preliminary rankings. And that's been a lot of fun. Uh, and then on the other pod, we're going to do our 51 to 50, uh, um, top minor leaguers dynasty for dynasty. Uh, that episode should be out, I think Sunday. Um, but lots going on. I've been able to actually bring my laptop to work and uh, in some of my downtime, do some of the data entry stuff to get the spreadsheets done, which has been a lot of fun for me as well. Um, I actually love the dog days because it just gives you blocks of hours to do to play with data. And uh, I've been looking forward to this moment for quite a while. Uh, last thing is for listeners who aren't in our league, um, we are planning a uh our to have our annual draft in um, Phoenix for spring training for a weekend, which is I think we're all pretty freaking giddy about uh, making this happen. So good stuff. Um, did you have an open forum question? Did you have anything else you wanted to discuss? Um, my open forum was pretty weak. I was going to ask you, um, is there any uh, moves still out there? that you're really rooting for either for the Mariners or for your fantasy team? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I would love to see the Mariners sign uh, Michael Conforto. I think he would be a, a huge addition to the Mariners lineup. Um, I think if you could add Conforto and Te Teoscar to what's already there, you're talking about a, a World Series contender. Uh, if Con Even if Conforto gave you was just a strong side platoon bat, um, he's a huge, be a huge upgrade over, not that I don't want Kelnick to play. I think Kelnick will play, but against right-handers, if it's Julio, Conforto, Teoscar, and Kelnick as your four players taking up the three outfield spots in the DH, I think that's a really good place to start. Um, seeing Rodon, I, I had mixed emotions about seeing Rodon. We'll talk about it next episode. Rodon going to the Yankees. I love him as a pitcher. I rostered him last year. I trade subsequently uh, traded him, but seeing him in a Yankees uniform, I don't, I don't know that I could have rooted for that necessarily. Um, and then I am actively trying to trade Robbie Ray in, in our home league. Uh, Cause I don't know that I have space for him and I don't really understand why I can't 
find any real takers for a 200 strikeout pitcher with the three, five ERA, but you know, whatever to each their own. Uh, that's the move that I can see myself making. Um, I've got plenty of offers out there, but yeah, I think the Conforto move for the Mariners, I'd love to see. Um, someone like Brandon Drury might be a, a, a luxury, but I think he would be a great signing as well. He's probably looking for more than what the Mariners are offering. The other one is I don't want to see Dansby Swanson go to any of my favorite teams because I think he's vastly overrated. How about you? Um, I'm really hoping that Texas adds another professional bat, maybe in the outfield to lengthen their lineup a little bit. Obviously they've tried to address pitching. Um, and I think honestly, the thing that's enticed me the most is <laughs> all this speculation that the Dodgers are saving up resources for Otani, mm -hmm. which is completely, you know, it's probably a fairy tale. <laughs> Right. If anybody thinks they really know what the Dodgers are thinking, but uh, just the thought of seeing him in, in Dodger blue is uh, pretty damn exciting. Yeah. Well, it's it's funny because the <laughs> the that happened with Giannis Antetokounmpo in, in the NBA, where everyone thought Giannis was going to become a free agent, and everyone just kind of squirreled their free agent money away the two years leading up to his free agency. And then he said, you know what? I want to win a championship in Milwaukee. I'm resigning. And all those teams were stuck holding a bag full of money that they went and spent on inferior players. And I don't know that that happens with Otani, but I think it's, it's dangerous to play that game where you're um, speculating on a player moving to a different team, you know, in the next years, I do think it, it with the team, again, going back to the Mariners, a team like the Mariners may not lay out a bunch of money, because there is potential for him to sign in Seattle. You know, if you're not the Dodgers, you don't have unlimited funds. I think it was smart. If, if it came down to the decision of signing a, you know, a bigger free agent that you don't absolutely love versus waiting a year to see if you can't get Otani, I think that made some sense, but we'll see. I don't, I don't, I love Otani too. I don't know if, the, if that's the right, or that's the place that he'll go. I don't, like you said, I don't think any of us do necessarily. No. Any other players? There's not a whole lot left. No, there's not. We're kind of picking through the, the last part of how players fit. I think talking about pitching will be very interesting when we have that episode. Anything else? Yeah. Nope. Awesome. It's good to All see right. you. Man. Good to see you. Take care, brother. Well. All right. Bye.